can ask you to turn in your Bibles, please, to Ezekiel and chapter 48. Ezekiel 48, and I just want to read verses 30 to 35. Ezekiel 48 and verses 30 to 35. These are the exits of the city. On the north side, measuring 4,500 cubits, the gates of the city shall be named after the tribes of Israel. The three gates northward, one gate for Reuben, one gate for Judah, and one gate for Levi. On the east side, 4,500 cubits, three gates, one gate for Joseph, one gate for Benjamin, and one gate for Dan. On the south side, measuring 4,500 cubits, three gates, one gate for Simeon, one gate for Issachar, and one gate for Zebulun. On the west side, 4,500 cubits with their three gates, one gate for Gad, one gate for Asher, and one gate for Naphtali. All the way around shall be 18,000 cubits, and the name of the city from that day shall be, The Lord is there. The Lord is there. Many of you um, may have seen recently, and heard indeed, when our late Queen's coffin, and of course her body within, was committed into the vault at St. George, George the Sixth uh, Chapel in Windsor. It was done so with her name and titles being read out. And this is what uh, we heard. Late Most High, Most Mighty and Most Excellent Monarch, Elizabeth II, by the grace of God of the United Kingdom and Northern Ireland, and of her other realms and territories, Queen, Head of the Commonwealth, and Sovereign of the Most Noble Order of the Garter. Now we know that through Scripture, God has many names and titles. We can think, as we were doing so with the children this morning, of the individual persons in the Godhead. As we were looking from God's Word this morning, we can think particularly of Jesus, for example, those I am statements that he made about himself. And at different points in the Old Testament, God is referred to. The name Jehovah followed by a further Hebrew word to describe him or an aspect of his character that relates to that particular context. So you might think, for example, of the story of Abraham, who is called, isn't he, to offer his only son Isaac. And so he goes up the hill, the mountain, to do so. And just as he is about to kill Isaac, so uh, he, he is caused to notice that there is a ram uh, with its head caught in the thicket, a ram provided instead. And Abraham calls the name of the place, the Lord will provide, Jehovah Jireh. I mentioned in passing this morning Gideon. In Judges he has that interaction with the angel of the Lord in the wine press where he is threshing wheat. And when Gideon realises that he has seen the angel of the Lord, he thinks that he will die. But the angel of the Lord reassures him and says, Peace be to you. And so Gideon builds an altar and calls it, The Lord is Peace, or Jehovah Shalom. I'm sure you may be able to think of other examples, and there are several more, but we have a further one here, right at the end of Ezekiel, chapter 48 and verse 35. The Lord is there, or the Lord is present. Jehovah Shammah, S-H-A-M-M-A-H. And this name, as I've just said, and as you can clearly see, comes right at the very end of Ezekiel's prophecy. 
And in the particular context, the name is given to the city of Jerusalem. It is in Jerusalem, at its heart, that the temple is located. And Ezekiel says that the Lord is there. Now Ezekiel is a prophet of God in exile. He, along with many other Jews from Judah, that is the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, including Daniel and his three friends, though earlier, have been taken into Babylonian captivity. And his ministry is specifically to these Jewish exiles. And if you were to go back in Ezekiel's prophecy to chapter 10, you would read of God's glory and presence departing from the temple. Solomon's temple that you can read about that was built with such magnificence and the place where God had promised that his glory, the symbol of his presence with his people, would be located. But this has come to an end. God is abandoning Jerusalem and the temple because of the people's sins and disobedience to his commands and laws. But right here at the end of the prophecy, we have a promise that God's presence, his glory, will return. Now we can read about the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem under the leadership of Nehemiah. And the temple was rebuilt under Zerubbabel with the encouragement of Haggai and Zechariah. But it never matched the brilliance of Solomon's temple. You might remember if you read in Haggai, and it is in Haggai, that there were some who remembered that te temple, they wept because the new one seemed a poorer relation. Well, I wonder what are we to make of what we read here in Ezekiel. And I would suggest to you that some of Ezekiel's vision certainly seems to go beyond a reasonable literal understanding. You can look back, for example, chapter 47, verses 1 to 12, and we see the same here in chapter 48, and certainly the verses that we read, in verses 30 and 35. And I think that we are this evening to move beyond the physical Jerusalem and the physical temple to Christ, to his church, and to heaven. And I want us to do that this evening, thinking of Jehovah Shammah, the Lord is there or the Lord is present, just under three headings. Firstly, the Lord was there. Secondly, the Lord is there. And thirdly, the Lord will be there. So firstly, the Lord was there. As I mentioned earlier, Solomon's temple was destroyed by the Babylonian hordes under King Nebuchadnezzar in 586 BC, 380 years after it was first built. It was rebuilt, again, as I've already said, but it was not as impressive as the first. But nonetheless, God gave this promise through the prophet Haggai. Chapter 2 of his prophecy, verses 7 and 9. And I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of nations. And I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace says the Lord of hosts. But there is no evidence that God's glory filled the second temple, as it did the first. And the temple underwent extensive alterations between 19 BC and 64 AD. But it was destroyed by the Romans when they destroyed Jerusalem in AD 70. What are we to make of this then? Well, the prophet Malachi, the very last prophet in the Old Testament before there was that 400 years of silence 
The prophet Malachi says the following, chapter 3, verse 1, Behold, I send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Now the first part of that prophecy concerns John the Baptist. But the Lord referred to is the one for whom John was preparing the way. That is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord was there in the person of Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. Again, as we were seeking to think with the children this morning, For the illustration of the apple, Jesus Christ is the Son of God who was made flesh. He is Emmanuel, God with us. John tells us in chapter 1 verse 14 of his Gospel, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And the word that John uses there, dwelt, it means to pitch a tent or to tabernacle. And the Old Testament tabernacle was the forerunner of the temple. And it was where God met with his people. He met with Moses, for example. God chose to dwell amongst his people in a far more personal way through his Son, Jesus Christ. And when the tabernacle and then Solomon's temple was completed, the Shekinah Shekinah glory filled them. And though God the Son took on human form, His glory was still manifested by Christ. And there were those certain occasions where it was particularly seen. You might think of the Mount of Transfiguration. And you can read in the Gospels, of the Lord Jesus Christ, who came from time to time to the physical temple. He was blessed there by Simeon, wasn't he? When he was only a few days old. He listened and spoke to the teachers of the law there when he was 12 years old. He overturned the tables at the temple on two occasions. And at one of these he was asked for a sign as to why he did these things. And he said the following, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple. And will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. You see, Jesus was using the temple as a sign of himself. And in particular, that he will rise again three days after his death. Jesus is saying, if you want another I am statement, I am the true temple. And again, there was another occasion when his disciples, they wanted Jesus to take notice of the temple and how wonderful it was and the architecture and so on. But Jesus says, it won't be long before not one stone of it is left upon another. It will be destroyed, as again I said earlier, in AD 70. I trust you see maybe just a little bit of what I think Haggai and Malachi were speaking about. You see what Ezekiel was speaking about. They may not have fully understood the full implications, but they were speaking, certainly partly so, about Christ's coming. He is the desire of nations. He came to the physical temple. He is the true temple of his people. And we'll come on to that in just a moment. His glory and his presence is greater than any man-made temple. He walked the streets of Jerusalem. He wept over it. He was crucified outside its city walls. In other words, when Jesus was on earth, truly it was 
Jehovah Shammah. The Lord is there. And for us who look back, we can say with wonder and with awe, and I hope it is with wonder and with awe, and with thanksgiving, the Lord was there. It's the most important and pivotal point in the entirety of human history. He was there. The Son of the living God was there. He was present in time. He was there for nine months in the womb of Mary. He was there, the little baby lying in a manger in the stable in Bethlehem. He was there in Jerusalem and in the lanes and the fields of Galilee and all Israel. And he was there on the cross laying down his life as a sacrifice for sin. He was there suffering in the place of his people that you and that I might be saved, might be forgiven, that we might have peace with God as Malachi says. Was he there suffering in your place? Dying to take away your sins? Making peace with God on your behalf? My friends, the Lord was there. Jehovah Shammah, the Lord Jesus Christ. But secondly, the Lord is there. As Jesus prophesied would happen, God indeed raised him from the dead three days after his crucifixion and burial. And where is he now? Where's the Lord Jesus now? He's there in heaven, isn't he? Having gone back there 40 days after his resurrection. He is there as his people's great high priest, ever living to intercede for them at his father's throne. He is there ruling and reigning over all things. And he is there ready to receive all who would turn to him in repentance and faith, trusting solely and wholly in him and his death on the cross at Calvary. But what does the Apostle Paul tell us about those who know and love the Lord Jesus as their Saviour? 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19 Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? Every individual Christian believer is indwelt by the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. And therefore, if that is us this evening, ridden across, as it were, our hearts, our bodies, could be and should be written, God is there. Jehovah Shammah. This is the residence of God. This is his temple. Jesus is king of my life. And this should affect everything that I do, and everything that I say, and everything that I think. We are not our own now. We belong to another, Paul tells us. And so we are to live accordingly with our bodies and in our spirits, all that we are. I wonder this evening, and I speak to myself, do we need to be reminded of that? Do people see evidence that God is with us and dwells in us? Paul writes something similar in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. And the context there is the church of Jesus Christ. Paul describes individual believers as temples of the Holy Spirit, but here he is speaking of the church as being a temple of God. Now the church in, in the scriptures is described in different ways, isn't it? But one of them is as a building, 
And the foundation stone is Jesus. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 11. But hear what else Paul writes, this time to the Ephesians. You may want to turn to it if you can. But Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 19 to 22. Ephesians 2 and verse 19. Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together for a habitation or a dwelling of God in the Spirit. It's important to pay attention to the words that Paul employs here. He says that Christ is not only the foundation stone, but he's the chief cornerstone, the stone that sets the foundation and squares the building. And the whole building grows into a holy temple in the Lord. And Paul speaks there of you, individual Christians, yes, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, but you who make up the church of Jesus Christ, the building, the temple. And he tells us that we're fitted together and that we are to grow. In other words, we're not on our own in the church. We are part of one structure. We're not talking now about the building, but part of the true church of Jesus Christ. And we do well to remember that, don't we? And then according to Peter this time, in 1 Peter and chapter 2 and verse 4, coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. Christ is now the living stone. And we as believers in him, in verse 5, you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So we as believers in him are living stones, And we are being built up a spiritual house. We are a holy priesthood. We offer up sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We offer our lives as a daily sacrifice. Daily worship of and service to our King. Do you see then what Haggai and Malachi were saying? Do you see the links? The crossovers. You see that this is not all just sort of thrown together. This temple that Paul is speaking about, that Peter is speaking about, is more glorious than Solomon's or the second temple. They have passed away. They are pointers forward to something greater that God has prepared. And Christ is at the heart of it. Listen to the prophet Zechariah, chapter 6, verses 12 to 13. Behold the man whose name is the branch. That's a name for Christ. From his place he shall branch out and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Yes, he shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule on his throne. So he shall be a priest on his throne and the council of peace shall be between them both. God in his infinite grace and wisdom has chosen to take up residence in the hearts and lives of his people and he has chosen to presence himself amongst his church. What a privilege that is. I wonder do we understand and grasp the privilege of that? What part are we playing as living stones in this temple, this building? Are you working towards this fitting together and growing as part of a local church? 
Can it be said of you as a church here this evening, as I trust it can be said of us back in Sudbury, the Lord is there, Jehovah Shammah? Do we long and pray for that to be more a reality? That the Lord is here, that the Lord is present, that he is working in us and through us to know and to see and to experience perhaps in just some small measure the presence of the Shekinah glory as our forefathers did. And it starts with us. Living as those across whom is written, God is there. Starts with us praying more earnestly and fervently that we might see his glory. Above all, I believe, through the preaching of his word. And it starts with us playing our part as living stones in this wonderful, unique structure. Oh, to tremble and shudder to ever think God could ride across the door frame, Ichabod. The glory has departed. God is no longer there. We need to learn from Ezekiel. The glory of the Lord departed the temple because of the people's sin and disobedience against God and his word. And the people were judged and found wanting and were exiled to Babylon. Let us not be like them, but let us examine ourselves and remain true to our God and his word and pray and work for greater days to come. Not resting on our laurels and thinking that we're okay and that all is well. We can have all the programs and all the people in the world, but if it is not Jehovah Shammah, then it is for nothing. The Lord is there. Finally this evening, the Lord will be there. The Lord will be there. Ezekiel speaks of the city and he says that the Lord is there. Is the physical city of Jerusalem merely in view? I think not. I think our minds and our eyes of faith can move on to the New Jerusalem, glory itself. I'm told by those who've looked into these things, the scholars, that there are 48 direct or indirect quotations of Ezekiel in the book of Revelation. That's not really a surprise to me, because a lot in Revelation is about heaven. When God left the temple and Jerusalem, there was great misery. But as someone has said, his presence in heaven makes it heaven. And his presence in the church makes it happy. His presence in heaven makes it heaven. And his presence in the church makes it happy. Let's pray for truly happy churches. Because God is there. But let's give thanks that in heaven, God is there. And always will be. What do we read in Revelation chapter 7, verses 15 to 17? Therefore they are before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They shall neither hunger any more, nor thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any heat. For the Lamb is who, in the, who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of waters. And God will wave, wipe away every tear from their eyes. And John could write in Revelation 21 and verse 22, uh, as uh, we read, but I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Truly absent from the body, present with the Lord. Where loved ones who knew Christ are, who have gone before us. Where all his people are, who have gone before. Present with the Lord, 
because the Lord is there. And we look forward that the Lord will be there forever and ever. And we will be with him if we know him and love him as our Savior. But what does John see when Christ comes again at the end of the ages to judge? Revelation 21, 1-4, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. And there shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Let me ask you as we close this evening, will you be there? Or will you be banished from his immediate presence forever and ever? Come to Jehovah Shammah now and pray that through faith in Jesus Christ, the great head of the church, you might be made into a living stone and be indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Jehovah Shammah, the Lord is there. And I pray that the closing words or the words of our closing hymn may truly be our prayer as we sing them. Love divine, or love's excelling, joy of heaven to earth come down, fix in us thy humble dwelling, all thy faithful mercies crown. Jesus, thou art all compassion, pure unbounded love thou art, visit us with thy salvation, enter every trembling heart, breathe, O oh, breathe thy loving spirit, into every troubled breast, let us all in thee inherit, let us find thy promised rest. Come, Almighty, to deliver, let us all thy grace receive. Suddenly return and never, never more thy temples leave. Thee we would be always blessing, serve thee as thy hosts above. Pray and praise thee without ceasing, glory in thy perfect love. Well, let's stand and sing this lovely hymn together as we close.